Okay, so currently our ordinance states that <clears throat> it requires one mile between solar projects, and that is measured property line to property line, as that is how we approve special use permits. We cannot approve a special use permit on a portion of a property. Um, additionally, it also requires that the applicant enter into negotiations for a siting agreement with the Board of Supervisors prior to that application being submitted. There we go. Um, so currently we have eight solar projects that are operational. They're listed on, um, in your packet. We have two that are under construction. Um, we have one that we are currently reviewing erosion and sediment control plans for. Um, so we have not issued any um, construction permits, but they do have special use permit issued for that project. Um, there are 10 projects that have, currently have special use permits issued for them, but we have not started reviewing plans or issued any construction permits for those. And we have one project that is going through the special use permit process. It actually goes to the Board of Zoning Appeals for approval or denial on Monday. So the proposed um, ordinance revisions as we presented to you all um, at the previous legislative committee meeting, um, we are proposing to increase the buffer requirement or the radius back to five miles from one mile, which is what it previously was. Um, and this map right here kind of shows you what that five miles would look like. Um, and you can see the areas in the county that are outside of five mile, a five mile radius of any other approved project and could potentially um, accommodate an additional solar project. In addition to that, we've also proposed that no more than 2% of the total acreage within a single zoning district shall be approved for use as a utility scale solar energy facility. And I've broken down some current statistics for you on this slide. Um, A1, the total acreage of A1 properties in the county is 471,292.82 acres. Um, so 2% of that would be 9,425.86. We currently have 16,974.3 acres in solar that is zoned A1. So as you can see, we would already be over that 2% cap if you all were to adopt that. Um, the acreage in approved solar has increased since we originally discussed the 2%. Um, you can see M1 is broken down there, and so is M2. So 2% of M1 would be 141 acres. Um, there's currently 872 acres zoned M1 that is in solar, and that's at 12.3% of all total properties zoned M1 in the county. And then for M2, there's 6,842.54 total acres. 2% of that would be 136.85. And we currently have 125 acres um, in solar that is zoned M2. However, if you go back to the look at the map um, that shows that five miles. We do not have any, and it's on the, on the screen in front of you. You can see there's a lot of green. Um, there is not a lot of M1 or M2. And that is because we currently have two properties um, that are M1 that are located outside of a five mile radius of any approved project. We have no M2 parcels that are outside of a five mile radius of a, a currently approved project. So um, you would not have any, any properties that are zoned M2 that solar could locate on. So this is just kind of additional breakdown of the individual districts and, and how they're zoned. This is countywide um, and this just shows a breakdown of acreage per zoning classification for the entire county. And then we have broken that down further by, and it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but it is in your packet. Um, we've broken that down further by district. So you can see in your district how many acres there are of A1, how many M1, M2, and so on. And this is total, this is not in solar, this is total acres zoned. 
So additionally, there's one additional um, provision that we talked about at the last legislative committee meeting. There was some concern um, if we had a large economic development prospect that was interested in solar, how could we exclude them from these requirements so that you know we would not harm our chances of them selecting Pennsylvania County to locate um, their business. So we, we met with Matt Rowe, Economic Development Director, and we crafted some language um, and discussed <coughs> where we thought that it would be appropriate to apply this exclusion. Um, and so according to Matt, he felt that the only um, industrial park that we had that a business of the caliber that would be interested in green electrons or going green completely um, would be located at Berry Hill, mm -hmm. so at the Southern Virginia mega site. Um, so the language that we have proposed is that utility scale solar energy facilities shall be exempt from section 35-141C items one and two, which would be that five mile buffer and that 2% cap um, and if the proposed project has entered into a power purchase agreement or similar agreement um, with a tenant company located within the defined boundaries of the Southern Virginia mega site at Berry Hill, which also has an approved local performance <laughs> agreement with the Board of Supervisors. So this would only apply to companies that have come before you all, you all have ne negotiated a local um, performance agreement and then they have also entered into a power purchase agreement um, with a utility company. Um, so they would be the only ones that this exemption would apply to. And Matt felt that this adequately protected the county from any adverse effects relating to economic development um, that he could foresee relating to our updating our solar order. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all have. Any questions? Ms. Chairman, I make a motion that we proceed with sending this to the full board for their approval uh, as presented and stipulating that the ones that already have special use permits or have it submitted the application for special use permits are exempt mm -hmm. uh, from the policy, but going forward, this will be the new policy. Do I get a second? I'll second. And Emily, just to be clear, um, because we thought time was of the essence of this, uh, this is proposed to be advertised for action at the board's March business meeting, right? Yes, it is. Like it passed. All right. Next, temporary residential occupancy of campers, ordinance review. I give Ms. Ragsdale. So this is another um, potential ordinance revision that we discussed at the last um, legislative committee meeting. Um, <clears throat> and so it's coming back to you with a few, um, a few changes um, that were discussed. Um, so this is what our Current ordinance says, it says that no major recreational equipment um, can be occupied um, unless it is located in an area that is approved for such use. And the only areas in the county approved for such use are um, approved campgrounds. And so we have very few of those. So the proposed um, ordinance language, we went through it pretty extensively last time, but I will go through it again. Um, staff removed, you know, we asked you before if you wanted to restrict this to certain zoning districts. Um, the, the legislative committee did not, so we removed that. So this would apply to all um, zoning districts. We also um, clarified the, and actually I think it got left out of the PowerPoint, but it is in your proposed ordinance revisions. Um, we clarified the end um, statement that says that this shall not 
apply to situations where the primary residence was substantially damaged or destroyed as a result of any criminal act um, instead of just act. We, we included the criminal um, wording there or negligence within the control of the owner. Um, furthermore, this shall not apply to new construction or renovations that are not a direct result of damage beyond the property owner occupant's control. Um, so um, pretty much everything else um, stayed the same um, and we'll be happy you know, to have conversations as we move forward, but I want to give you some reasoning as to why staff left a lot of these requirements the same. So here are some pictures, and these, are, these pictures are all campers that we have cited, located in Pennsylvania County, and all of these were cited based on complaints from adjacent property owners. Um, so I'm going to go through and just kind of identify some of the issues um, that staff sees with these. So the first one, in this middle picture, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, um, but there is an electrical box there. Mm -hmm. It is not an appropriate electrical box. It is not installed with permits. It has a makeshift electrical plug wired into it, and it's being run with a drop cord. Um, at you, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but there are all kinds, you know, it's backed up right to that pole. I'm assuming that that pole has a light on it. If you zoom in really closely, there are wires running from that pole to the um, the antenna next to it. I don't know if the light is plugged into this box or not, um, but this creates a very hazardous situation. Um, this is one of the reasons that staff would require building permits be issued, um, and we would not allow occupancy until it, the temporary pole had been installed and we could do adequate inspections to make sure that it was safe for the occupants of the RV. Um, so the one on the left, that camper is in a vacant field. Staff has no knowledge of any previous dwelling there. Therefore, we have no knowledge of any well or septic on the property. Um, as you can see, they're starting to, it's kind of hard to see in the picture, but they're starting to accumulate some stuff around it. Um, and one of the complaints we got was it was starting to look junky from one of, a from one of the neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, but additionally, we can't guarantee where their septic is going. Um, there's a creek down the hill from this. I can't trespass on the property to see exactly where it's going, but I could have a good idea of where it will end up um, based just on the fact that there is nothing around them allowing them to, to pump out their, their black tank and their gray water tank. And then on the right, um, this camper is inoperable. Um, I think it was missing a wheel and the other ones were flat. Um, it's not movable. It, it could not be hooked up and moved down the road. Um, there was no inspection sticker anywhere on the camper. All campers that have onboard brakes have to have Virginia inspection stickers in order to be transported up and down the road. Um, someone was living in this. They did not, they were not even using electricity. I'm not sure where their waste was going. I'm not sure of any of that, but we did receive a complaint. Um, so that, that's another issue. So this right here is a picture of a well that was hooked to a camper. Um, it's an above ground pump. I have the health department here so they can speak to some issues. Um, that could be, you know, could arise from that. Um, our assumption is it's an agricultural well. Um, there was no dwelling around here. Um, it was probably installed for agricultural uses for livestock. Um, it's now supplying water, potentially drinking water, <coughs> um, and even water to shower to an <coughs> RV. Um, it's likely not been tested, um, and that's an issue. Um, the health department is here and they can answer some more questions on that if you do have those. Um, this picture in the right hand corner, let's see, as you can see the camper sits kind of back in the background, it kind of gets lost in all the stuff in front of it. Um, there's trash all over the property, 
There's debris all over the property. There's tires on the property. Um, we have no knowledge of any house that existed on this property. Therefore, there's, it's very unlikely there's an existing well and septic. And again, there was a creek down below this camper. Um, I can't guarantee you that that's where their sewage was going, but there's a good possibility, as there were never vehicles here, but we caught people going in and out. So they did not have a vehicle to move the camper um, to take it anywhere to have it pumped off. Um, and I, I seriously doubt anyone was coming to the property to pump it off. This, it's hard to see in the picture, but this one, um, there is a sewage pipe hooked up to the camper. There was a house located on the same property, but when we sighted them, the homeowner told me that their sewage was not, that they told, they wouldn't let them hook into their septic. Mm. So there's a sewage pipe hooked to the camper, and I don't know where it's going. Um, and we know it's not going to the septic because the homeowner verified that. Um, so just some superseding regulations. There are some things in here that we can change. We're requiring that they meet setbacks to our um, zoning ordinance. Um, we're requiring that they have a, a current state inspection sticker because if they're being moved up and down the road, they should by state code unless it does not have onboarding you know, brakes located on the trailer. They should have a valid current state inspection sticker per the state code. Um, we also are requiring that they're up to date on their property taxes. Um, one of those reasons is my staff currently does not issue building permits to, for properties that are delinquent on property taxes. And delinquent even means the first half of the year. So if it is past the due date in June, our system flags it as being delinquent and you have to either get current on your taxes or you at least have to ha enter into a payment plan with the treasurer's office um, and provide us proof with that before we can issue or will issue a building permit. Um, and so I do not think that it is right to ask my staff to make determinations as to which situations it's okay to um, overlook that um, procedure and when it's not. I don't, I don't think it's fair to them to make those determinations. So we left that in here. Um, but there are some things that we don't have any control over. And I'll let, I'll, in a second I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Waller and I'll let her talk about some requirements from the health department um, if this is to pass. But they are one thing that they, their requirements supersede us. Um, that's state code. Um, so we at least have, to, at the bare minimum, have to meet their requirements. Um, and so they oversee sewage disposal systems and public water supplies. So they're gonna oversee your well and your septic and any connections to those. Um, and then we also have the Uniform Statewide Building Code. And since the county adopted the Uniform Statewide Building Code, we have to enforce the Statewide Building Code. Mm -hmm. We can't pick and choose which portions of it we enforce and which portions we don't. Um, and so that regulates all construction trades, including electrical, plumbing, structural, and mechanical. Um, so any new electrical service, any changes to electrical service, all of that has to be inspected prior to the utility company um, energizing that temporary pole, permanent power source. Um, any new plumbing lines that have to be run, that has to be inspected to make sure that it's at the proper depth, that it's not going to freeze and thaw, um, and that all the connections are made properly. Um, and then we're not likely going to have a structural issue, but um, and mechanical is not likely an issue that's going to come up here either. Um, but I'll turn it over to Kelly and let her kind of give you a rundown on um, some things that they would be looking at. box to make sure there was no damage to any of that, um, you know, during the incident that caused the damage to the home. 
Um, if they don't have an existing septic, you know, that would be you guys letting us know that somebody's approached you about having a camper there. We, we would address that on a complaint basis of, you know, their sewage on the ground. Um, we wouldn't let them stay there if they didn't have some approved means of getting rid of that wastewater. And the, as far as the water, you know, we would want that to be an approved source. So if it's already an existing home and somebody's staying in a camper, we would, that well would have already been tested. Now, if it's something like the picture she had with the bucket that maybe is an ag well, they'd have to get that tested before we would say it's okay for them to use that well, you know, for drinking, cooking, and bathing in. Um, you know, and then, of course, we would address the issues with the sewage on the ground from the health department standpoint. But we would want to know when they're ex connecting to an existing system because the strength of sewage out of a camper is going to be stronger than that from the house just for the chemicals that people use in them. But if you guys have any other questions, I'm happy to try to answer those for you. Yes, Mr. Scarce. Just got one question. Would, um, I know some of the construction sites will use porta potties for, for those kind of uh, issues. Would that preclude having to hook to a septic tank if, if they went that route? Actually, it's in the sewage regulations that portable toilets are only for construction, temporary events, or government use, so that we wouldn't allow them to do that. So they'd either have to hook to an approved septic or provide us a pump and haul agreement with a sewage handler that was going to come and empty it on a frequency that would keep mm -hmm. it from being emptied on the ground that might end up on the, you know, into the waterways <coughs> of Virginia because that's definitely not in compliance with the sewage regs. That's good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that's it. And, and just some other things for you all to keep in mind. Um, you know, we, we understand that the intent of this is to help those in need and staff echoes that and we want to help people who are in bad situations and provide a place for them to go. What we don't want to do is allow them to end up in another situation that is going to be unsafe for them or cause negative impacts to adjacent properties. Um, you know, one thing that Kelly did not talk about, sewage on the ground that can seep into neighboring wells. Um, that can cause issues for adjacent property owners, not just, um, you know, the person, the person whose property it, it's on. Um, so we want to make sure that it's safe and that these, these regulations adequately protect them and their neighbors. Mr. Yes, Chairman, uh, Ms. Rangstel, um, how about a situation because it's applicable to R1 too. We have some properties in R1 that the landowner owns the, ha the lot that his house is on, owns the lot beside it that nothing is on, okay? Has a fire, Can't, not livable. We're doing setbacks and all and we stated in here, I think I read somewhere that it had to be on the property that the structure was on. So what if it, it only makes sense in some of those R1s to put it on his lot that's next door that can still access his water and septic or <coughs> sewage line? What are we gonna do about those? Likely, um, and this may be a question for Kelly, um, likely it's, you know, he's got his existing well and septic on one property. He's going to have to do a whole lot to be able to access or be able to reach potentially his existing septic depending on where it's located on his property. He may not have direct access to it. Um, I don't know if the health department would allow that because they don't normally allow neighboring properties to use a I mean if you're if you are if the that could be a sewage line if you're on city sewage that I, I know of one neighborhood where it runs right through there so it would be no problem to one it has water on that 
piece of property, and two, it would have access to hook up to the sewage line at hardly any cost. I mean, if it's going to hook to public utilities, we wouldn't get involved in that. That would be between the property okay. owner and the county and the public utilities. But if it's a private septic and you want to go from the lot beside of it, you'd have to consider, is it gravity? Would they need to install a tank with a pump to get it to that system? Because putting any kind of components in the ground requ requires a permit from our office to do that. So they may have to hire a private If it's soil public, consultant. we're okay. If it's public, then that would be between PCSA running, you know, them running and connecting and having a tap put in. You know, for them, that wouldn't be anything we'd get involved in. But if it's how I want to connect to my private, you know, system that's over here where I can't live and I'm going to have to rework the whole, you know, house site and I just want to get over here on this piece of property, we'd have to consider the gravity and, you know, would it be able to go to that existing system and where is the tank comparable to where, how much lines, how many clean outs would they need because they're supposed to have one of those for every 40 feet. Yeah, and it is a complicated issue because when you look at some of the condensed population just off of 41, you know, some of those lot sizes, you know, make it pretty prohibitive to put, I mean, I mean, I know yes everybody and no. would like So it. our ordinance has um, the ability to allow for reduced setbacks on lots that are smaller than what the current ordinance requires. So a lot of those in, in the 41 area, um, they were lots of record prior to the zoning ordinance being adopted. Um, so the, the ordinance recognizes those and allows for reduced setbacks um, to help accommodate some of these uses. Um, and we could add some language, you know, reducing the required setbacks um, in situations like that um, so that it didn't restrict somebody's ability to, to use a camper. Um, but those situations are far, few and far between. Most of them are going to be on lots that could accommodate them. And staff's thought of that is if your, your neighbor should not be locating their RV right on your property line. Um, you know, they should be able, they should have to meet the setback that you would if you were to put a building because this is going to become technically a permanent structure for six months. Um, it's not going to move. It's going to be a permanent structure um, and it's going to be set up as such. So it should meet the requirements of all other permanent structures. But we could look at some, <coughs> some language well, to reduce I, that. You know, I, I, in this, the way we have to do it doesn't come for just a specific case. It's covering all areas. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking and looking at it from someone that has a tragedy and a fire and needs somewhere to live, and you want to be so flexible in that, but there are unintended consequences when you get too flexible. So I get it. I get it. I have a question. Um, this came up to help someone that had potentially lost a good part of their home, if not all of it. Um, in that situation, where are we looking at as for speed of issuance of these permits? Being that this is um, an unusual circumstance. Um, we issue permits as soon as we get application. So um, once we got an application, um, if the homeowner is not doing the work themselves, they would have to hire a licensed contractor to do that work. And that state code, I don't have any way around that. Um, so as soon as they retained that inspector or they were ready to do the work themselves to set their temporary pole and run any um, water or sewer lines that they needed to, to connect to their septic, um, we would then issue the permit and we we try to work in emergency situations. So somebody loses power because of a storm, um, we have storm damage. We work them in as soon as we can for inspections, even if our inspectors are booked for a day. Um, so if it was an emergency situation like this, we would guarantee that they would have an inspection the day after they called it in, if not the same day, if we could accommodate them. Um, Chris Slimp can probably speak a little bit better to this than I can, but I know that the Red Cross in a lot of emergency situations will provide 
um, accommodation for a couple nights. Mm -hmm. um, that as long as the homeowner did not procrastinate on getting, you know, contractors to come out and do the work, that would likely cover the amount of time needed to get the permit issued and everything safely connected um, so that they could move into their RV so they would not be without somewhere to stay um, during that time period. Yeah, I mean, uh, I understand the, the, the for lack of a better word, regulation, because you don't want a situation that was already bad made worse when things aren't done properly like, like the slides presented. But I also, you know, I don't want them to be ham feel like they're hamstrung. They're, they've lost, let's say they've lost everything they got. And then for, you know, to go through the hoops, I, I would like to think we would try to do anything to, to expedite, expedite it in a safe and a right, in a reasonable manner too. But, you know, they got enough headaches as it is, which hopefully that's a few and far between um, situation. But that's kind of what if I was a homeowner and I lost and the last thing you want to do is, is go through hoops. And you're going to be going through plenty of them. And I can't speak for any other regulatory agencies, but my department tries to be very accommodating in emergency situations. Um, you know, we try to, if someone loses power, we try to be very um, quick with our turnaround time for inspections and permits and things like that because we know what type of inconvenience that is if you're without power, so, even for a day. So, Emily, just to be clear, in these rare situations where there are emergencies, I think it's safe to say that your office would prioritize yes. these yes. permits over others. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ragsdale, um, just to kind of hitchhike on uh, Mr. Cheshire's coattails there, um, I understand you're streamlining the process. Is it possible, and uh, we don't want to put any undue stress on you, but maybe, for example, uh, there should be some document, maybe one page that's simplified in the event of emergency that uh, the public can digest quickly. Is that possible? Um, explaining the, the requirements? Yes, okay. we could do that. We could put together some type of um, something similar to our building permit application or a one, a one page informational sheet yep. um, that would explain all of this and how to go about getting these required permits and inspections. Gentlemen, any more questions? All right, I'm gonna make a motion to recommend the full board authorize the county staff to advertise the legal required public hearing to a potentially amend PCC 35-87 temporary camping at the board's April meeting, business meeting. I'll second the motion. All righty, new business. Um, Planning Commission, Mr. Ingram, voting status change discussion. Mr. Ingram. You caught me off guard there. I did bring this up uh, some time back. So uh, Mr. Carlberg that serves on social services. He's Mr. Dudley's appointee. He started beating a drum on this. And back then I said, well, I'll bring it up and try to make sure that there was uniformity uh, amongst all the boards. And this uh, was the only board left to where we needed to address whether or not the Board of Supervisors member was a voting member, which meant that that respective district would get two votes. And so if you leave it as is, uh, that's what will happen. If you simply say that the Board of Supervisors member is a liaison and that he is not a voting member, that will correct the problem. Thank you. Any discussion, gentlemen? I'll just point out, I don't have a problem one way or the other with it, but in the over seven years I've been on the board, I don't know that on the planning commission it's ever became a problem, 
because it should be like Mr. Dalton right now. It's his district, it's his constituents. He should have the pulse of them more than anybody else. So I would certainly hope we as a board, once it got here, we're gonna follow him anyway uh, and be respectful of his district. So I, in that particular one, I don't see a big deal, but I do agree consistency is probably a good thing. But, you know, I, I just don't. I don't see in that particular category where it's of the matter too, but it does make perfectly good sense to to be consistent and then you got the same thing going everywhere. Stuck. I like consistency. I mean, you know, uh, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So um, obviously, all of our colleagues, we respect each other's, you know, boundaries and districts, that sort of thing. But I, I think it's important that uh, we present uniformity and consistency across the board. Any other discussion? I'll make a motion that uh, we send it to the Ford Board to approve the change to the Planning Commission to, to bring it in line with all the other committees and commissions that we have that it's a liaison position. Do I get a second? I'll second that. All righty. Matters from the committee members, if any. Mr. Tucker, do you have anything, sir? Nothing at this moment. Thank you. Good meeting, sir. Mr. Warren. No, sir. None for myself. My meeting is adjourned.